Cavendish, and um, we are sharing this ministry from St. Paul Lutheran in Asheville, Ohio. We are in the middle of a Lenten series, um, David Lose's book, Making Sense of the Cross, and we're sharing uh, audio video version for those who need to listen to be a part of this study. We are in chapter two. I'm here with Rachel Reed. She is um, my um, co-reader tonight. We're in chapter two. It's called Portraits and Perspectives. So you said that the four gospel accounts offer complementary but distinct pictures of Jesus and in particular of the cross. Yes, and I really liked your comparison of the four gospels to looking at a work of art from different angles, each one emphasizing different attributes of the sculpture so that taken together, you have a richer, more three-dimensional view. Thanks. You're welcome. It occurred to me that a similar way to think about it might be to imagine four talented artists painting the same scene or person. You can see the resemblance between the paintings because the subject is the same, but each portrait offers a different perspective, focusing on something deeply true that only that artist sees. Yeah, I like that one too. It also underscores what's going on in the Gospels, really in the Bible more generally. What do you mean? The authors of the Bible didn't imagine themselves writing history as we think of it today. Instead, they were offering various portraits and distinct confessions of faith. They wanted to report what Jesus did, but they really wanted to show who Jesus is and why his life, death, and resurrection matter. They also wanted their confessions to do something. I'm not sure what you mean. How does a story do something? Good stories make an impact on us. They affect how we think and act. The Gospels are no different. In fact, they are primarily intended to persuade us of the truth they confess so that we actually shape our lives around the truth. So they wanted to emphasize the meaning of Jesus' life, not just report some facts. That makes sense. I read somewhere that in the ancient world, history was more about trying to make a point persuade people of the truth about something. It was far more than recording things with factual accuracy the way we do today. That's right. Furthermore, the four gospel writers were not offering these confessions in general, but to specific communities of faith. And so each gospel starts with a particular group of Christians in mind and tries to tell the story in a way that makes sense to them while also addressing some of the particular concerns, problems, and setbacks that specific community was having. For instance? Well, it's widely thought that Mark's community was undergoing or had recently emerged from persecution of some kind, while some think John's community was largely made up of people who had been quarreling with other Jews or who even had been recently expelled from a local synagogue. Similarly, while Matthew's community probably included mostly Jewish believers who were trying to understand how Jesus was the Messiah they were hoping for, Luke's people represented a variety of cultural and religious backgrounds. And all this stuff shaped how they painted the gospel portraits we now have. Exactly. And keeping all this in mind is helpful especially when we notice some of the differences between the four accounts. And how big are these differences you're talking about? Some are pretty small, like whether the disciples <laughs> fell asleep only once the night before Jesus' crucifixion, as in Luke, or three times, as in Mark and Matthew. Others are a lot bigger. Like, did Jesus die on the day of Passover or the day before Passover? Whatever the differences if we just remember that the Gospels are distinct confessions of faith, offering their own perspectives on a larger truth, then we don't need to get worried when we come across discrepancies in the stories or try to make them all fit. That actually makes a lot of sense. In fact, it seems like we could learn a lot from paying attention to the differences. Absolutely. 
Each difference we encounter functions like a clue to the meaning of the larger story the author is trying to tell. So when we come across a difference between, for instance, Luke and Mark, the question isn't, which one is right? But instead, what's Luke trying to tell us with this different detail? That's helpful and definitely worth remembering. Okay, where should we start? I think we'll appreciate the differences in the Gospels even more if we start with at least one overarching similarity shared by all four of them. It might seem obvious given what we talked about earlier, but it's still really important. What's that? Each of these four stories totally revolves around the cross. I guess that figures. After all, that's where we started, with how the cross is everywhere. But when it comes to the actual books in the New Testament, I thought you said earlier that it's Paul's letters that are totally about the cross. And the Gospels give us all of the other stories about Jesus. That's true. But all of the Gospels' stories about Jesus' teaching and miracles, and even his birth, point to the cross. What do you mean? Well, take the birth stories that Matthew and Luke tell. Each one has elements that help prepare us for the cross at the end of the story. Like foreshadowing in a good novel when a character has a dream or something and it gives you an idea of something that will happen later? Exactly. In Matthew, for example, you have the story about Herod, the local political authority. When he hears that the king of the Jews is about to be born, he consults with the chief priests and scribes, the religious authorities, to figure out where Jesus is supposed to be born. And then, when he can't find Jesus, he kills all the male babies in that area just to make sure he gets Jesus. That's terrible. I don't remember hearing that story. It's an awful story, so not everyone wants to read it. What happened to Jesus? His father was warned by an angel to flee to Egypt, so they got away safely. And this is the foreshadowing we were talking about. Herod trying to kill Jesus at the very beginning of his life? Right, because at the end of the story, another political leader, Pontius Pilate, conspires with chief priests, Pharisees, and scribes, the religious leaders, to put Jesus to death. Even from his birth, Matthew says, Jesus instilled fear in people, and they wanted to kill him. I see what you mean. Luke also uses foreshadowing in telling his story. When Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, bring Jesus to the temple for his naming, which happens eight days after birth in Jewish tradition, they meet an old man named Simeon who prophesies about Jesus' destiny as the Messiah. What does he say? He says lots of good things about Jesus being a light to many nations and the one who will restore the glory of Israel. Which makes sense because, as you said, Luke is addressing a community made up not only of Jewish believers, but persons from all different religious backgrounds. Right. But Simeon also says that Jesus is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And then he looks right at Mary and says, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. That's pretty chilling. Yeah, it really is. And that's the point. From his very birth, you knew there was trouble waiting. And these kinds of clues are everywhere in the Gospels. For instance, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus predicts his death and resurrection three times. Three times? Like once wasn't enough to get everyone's attention? Apparently not. But that's part of the story, too. No one expects the cross, not even when Jesus predicts it. Some of his parables and other teachings also point ahead to his rejection and crucifixion. But again, no one sees it coming. So I'm beginning to see what you mean about the cross being everywhere. Even if there are all these other stories, they are all still, in one way or another, about the cross. That's right. One biblical scholar said that reading Mark was like reading a passion narrative, a story about the cross, with a long introduction. In 
fact, about one-third of Mark's story is about the last week of Jesus' life. That's true of half of John's gospel, too. So a passion story with a long introduction seems to pretty well sum it up. But does that mean that the cross is the only thing that matters to the Gospels? Great question. The cross is central, as it's the place where these early Christians believed they saw God doing a new thing, being available for them in a new way. But the very nature of the Gospels shows that Jesus' whole life matters. Can you say a little more? Sure. As much as the Gospels focus on the cross, they tell the whole story of Jesus' life. So it's like they're saying that you can't really understand the cross without understanding his life, that is, by paying attention to the kind of life he lived and why people want to put him to death. At the same time, you can't understand his life apart from the cross. That is, this isn't just the story of one good man who challenged the status quo. It's the story of how God worked in and through Jesus' life and ministry, not just to care for the world, but actually to redeem it. So we need to think about Jesus' life says about his cross and what the cross tells us about his life. Right. Ultimately, all the Gospels are trying to show their readers how it is that we not only see God more clearly because of Jesus' life and death, but also how God meets them in and through their own suffering as they try to follow the life Jesus led. Makes sense. Although, to be honest, it's a lot to get my head around. You're absolutely right. But I think all of this will get clearer as we turn to look at the distinct confession of each gospel and see how each writer was trying to point to God's ongoing activity through his story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Sounds good. Where should we start? Let's begin with Mark. Oh, right, because you said that Mark was probably the first gospel written. Right. We can tell from some of the references Mark makes to the temple in Jerusalem that was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70, and from the fact that Luke and Matthew both seem to rely on Mark heavily for their accounts. This implies that they had a copy of Mark with them and when they wrote. Okay, so what's Mark's take on the cross? Well, there are a couple things that stand out. But rather than just name them, I think we'll appreciate Mark's theology more if we look closely at a few parts of Mark's actual story and see them in action. Kind of like looking at some of the details of a portrait, like we talked about earlier, firsthand. That makes sense. Good. While it would be best to read the whole of Mark's gospel, we can save a little time and start with a brief overview of the scenes in Mark's story. This will help us follow Mark's story better and also provide a good backdrop against which to read the other Gospels. Scenes? You make it sound like a play. Well, it is very much a drama, and the Gospel writers are very much artists, as we've been saying. So, scenes works well as a way of thinking about the movement of Mark's story. Got it. Mark arranges his passion narrative into five scenes. Passion narrative? The part of a gospel that focuses on Jesus' crucifixion and the events right before it happens. Okay. Here's a general outline of key events in Mark's gospel. In chapter 14, Jesus shares a last supper with his disciples. And then it continues. After this meal, Jesus goes with them to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prays, and then is betrayed. And then, Jesus is first taken to be questioned by the religious authorities. And then, as he moves toward chapter 15, we have the fourth section. Jesus goes in front of Pontius Pilate, the Roman political authority. And then, finally, Jesus is crucified dies, and is buried. And the other Gospels follow the same outline? More or less. Any variations on this order are things we'll want to pay attention to. What about the resurrection? You said that was important, too. It's very important. And each of the Gospel writers describe that quite differently. 
sometimes in several scenes all his own. So we'll talk about that as well, but we'll treat it as a distinct episode that comes after the passion story. All right, I think I'm with you. Great, so let's start with the scene in Gethsemane. Not the Last Supper? The Last Supper is, of course, important to the gospel stories and to Christian worship today. With Mark, I think I'd like to start in Gethsemane, the place Jesus goes to pray with his disciples and where his opponents come to find him. Okay. Let's look at this scene together and you can tell me what you notice. Wait a second. I thought you were explaining this to me. I'm definitely here to help, but anyone can read and understand the Bible. The key is treating it like any other good story you'd read by slowing down and noticing the details. So that's what I want you to do. Just listen to it like a story. And then tell me what sticks out to you. What details of Mark's carefully crafted drama make an impression. Okay. I'll give it a try. Great. Here it is. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And Jesus said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Do you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, Jesus went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Well, the first thing that sticks out to me was just how vividly Mark describes Jesus' fear about what's going to happen. I generally don't think of Jesus getting agitated. Most of the pictures you see in churches portray Jesus as so calm and serene, like nothing could ever bother him. But here he seems not just afraid, but downright upset. Yeah, I think that's true. It makes Jesus seem so, I don't know, human. I'm not sure if that's the best way to describe it, but it's definitely the word that comes to mind. I actually think that's a pretty good word. And it's one I've heard a lot of folks use when they read Mark. And is this one of the distinctive parts of Mark's story? It definitely contrasts, as we'll see, with John, where Jesus looks a lot more like the pictures in churches, always calm, cool, and collected. So why does Mark tell it this way? Well, let's start with your own reactions. How does this portrayal make you feel about Jesus? Like I said, it makes him seem very human, so I guess it means I can identify with him as a character. It also makes me wonder if at this point he's full of doubts, like maybe he wonders if he made a big mistake, if God really can save him. Again, this is all stuff I can identify with. Right. So keep in mind that Mark, as I said, was likely written to a community of Christians who were experiencing some pretty serious challenges. It may be that they were caught up in the Jewish-Roman war that ended in the destruction of the temple, or that they had recently endured persecution of one kind or another. So a big part of the purpose of Mark's gospel and the story of the cross in particular 
is to, to support these Christians by letting them know that Jesus suffered and so understands what they're going through. That makes sense. At the same time, Mark wants to offer Jesus as a model of being obedient, even though he's afraid. In this way, he encourages the people for whom he's writing his gospel to hold on to their faith. That's why Jesus both prays for the cup to pass, but also stays faithful, saying that in the end, it's not what he wants that is important, but what God wants. Right. What else did you notice? Well, to be honest, the disciples don't come off all that well. They totally failed Jesus during his time of need. I mean, all he asks is that they stay awake and keep him company, but they end up falling asleep, not just once, but three different times. No wonder Jesus is upset with them. Yeah, it's a pretty dramatic scene. And a little heartbreaking, too, to be so let down by your friends. So that was your impression of the disciples on the whole after this scene? Not a very good one. They don't exactly come across as dependable. That's very much the way Mark portrays them throughout the gospel. Why? I think there may be two reasons. First, this was a community of people who were struggling, perhaps suffering, and some of them well may have denied their faith under threat of persecution or even lost their faith altogether. And it may be that some of these folks wanted to come back and rejoin the community. So maybe Mark makes the disciples so human to emphasize that you don't have to be a hero to be a follower of Jesus. Even Christians who become afraid, who aren't dependable, and who deny their faith can still be disciples. Something like that? I think so. I like that. It's kind of like Mark is saying, look, if these guys can be Jesus' disciples, anyone can. I think that's very much one of the things Mark is saying in this scene. So what comes next? Jesus is betrayed by Judas, one of the 12 disciples, and taken to be questioned by the religious council. At the same time, Peter follows closely behind, though he can't go inside to where Jesus is being questioned. These two mini scenes taken together prove to be pretty dramatic as Mark not only portrays Jesus as being very human, but also shows that Jesus was telling the truth. What do you mean? Well, it wouldn't be fair to say that Jesus was in control. That's more what we'll find in John, or that he took everything like a stoic. Instead, what I mean is that even though Jesus was suffering greatly, it becomes more and more clear that he is who he said he was. I'm still not following. A little earlier in the story at the Last Supper, Jesus shares with his disciples. and He predicts that all the disciples will desert him and that Peter, who throughout the story is clearly the chief disciple, will deny him three times. Now, at the end of the scene with the council, when the religious authorities have decided that he's guilty and begin harassing him, some yell at him, prophesy. They might have been challenging the blindfolded Jesus to tell who was hitting him. Or they could have been asking him to make another bold prediction, as he had when they asked if he was the Messiah. What's interesting to me is that just at that moment, Mark switches his attention to Peter. Maybe we should look at this part together. And this is from chapter 14. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. And then the cock crowed. And the servant girl on seeing him began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And then after a little, while the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. 
At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. And then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter broke down and wept. Whoa, again, it's both dramatic and heartbreaking, but I think I see what you mean. At the same time that everyone is telling Jesus to make a prediction, one of his predictions is actually coming true, which might be a way Mark is saying to his people that no matter how bad it looks, Jesus really was telling the truth. Exactly. I wonder if that's also why Mark tells us that Peter didn't just deny Jesus, but actually cursed and swore an oath. Is that possible what some of the folks in Mark's community might have done when they were being persecuted? I mean, if they had, it would certainly be comforting to hear that Peter had done the same. I think that's very possible and a good insight. I also found the part about Peter weeping kind of moving, and I can see how someone who has deserted Christianity and later felt terrible about it would read that and totally be able to connect with Peter. Right. All right, so I think this is coming together for me. Mark wants his community to know that Jesus can understand what we're going through, that he was faithful and he encourages them to be the same, and that the disciples, including Peter, were no better than they were. I think that's a pretty fair summary. So where to next? I think one more passage will be helpful. It's right near the end of the Passion story when Jesus had been crucified. This is from chapter 15 of Mark. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. So what do you notice? A couple things, actually. First, Mark again spares no details about how difficult this is for Jesus. I mean, he cries out in what sounds like utter despair. Once again, all I can think to say is that Jesus is so very human. Definitely, even more so when you realize that it's the only thing Jesus says on the cross in Mark. What do you mean? It's the only thing he says in Mark? Does Jesus say other things in the other Gospels? All total, there are seven different things Jesus says from the cross. He says three different things in Luke and three more different things in John. We'll get to those later. But in Mark and Matthew, he only says this one thing that's called the cry of dereliction. Like you said, Mark depicts Jesus as being very human. I was also struck by the centurion. I mean, there he is, this Roman soldier who's just gotten done crucifying Jesus. And then he goes and says that Jesus is God's son. What did you make of that? Well, it seems like there's anyone likely to be unaffected by the cross. It would be the centurion. He's probably seen and done this before. And yet the cross gets to him. It convinces him in some way that Jesus really is God's son. So maybe Mark is pointing to the cross as the only place you can really see and experience God in a way that rings true, that's believable. I like that. There's one detail I don't understand, though, but maybe it's not that important. Which one is that? The part about the curtain that was torn in half. What's up with that? That's a great question, and a little background information will help. Okay. 
The Jerusalem temple was divided into several concentric sections. Everyone could be in the outermost areas, but as you went toward the center, it became increase, increasingly exclusive. Gentiles, people who weren't Jewish, could only go in so far. Women had to stop at a certain point, and then men. The innermost part of the temple was called the Holy of Holies, and only the high priest could go in there and only once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, in order to offer sacrifices to God. I didn't know any of that. That's very interesting. The Holy of Holies is the place Jews believe God's own presence was mediated to them through the high priest. And this part of the temple was separated by a huge curtain, 80 feet tall. And it got torn down when Jesus died? That's what the Gospels tell us. That seems like it would be pretty symbolic. Say a little more. Well, it sounds like this curtain that separated the presence of God from all the people was suddenly torn in half, actually torn away, making it possible for anyone to have access to God. Or maybe signifying that you can't keep God behind a curtain, that through the cross, God entered into our world and lives in a different way. Like God has been set loose in the world. That's actually very cool. Through Jesus, we are given access to God, and God has direct access to us. That's very much a part of this gospel's confession about Jesus. There's one other part that I think is significant too, although it has as much to do with the whole gospel as it does just the passion story. What's that? Do you remember how we've said that no one really expected the cross? Yeah, we said that's true in all the Gospels. In some ways, it's especially true in Mark. What do you mean? Well, remember how the disciples in Mark never got it? It's not just that they can't stay awake, but they're actually pretty clueless throughout. How come? I think Mark is saying that nobody would have ever, even in a million years, expected God to show up in the cross. I mean, it's not just the pain and suffering, but it's also the humiliation implied in being crucified. As we've seen, crucifixion is a pretty awful way to die. So awful, in fact, that no Roman citizen could legally be crucified. It was reserved as a punishment for criminals and other non-Romans who threatened or stood up to the Roman Empire. I guess that's why it would seem so unlikely that Jesus was really the Messiah, because you don't expect God to be working through someone who is crucified. Exactly. And yet that's where Mark says God shows up, just where we least expect God to be. And why does Mark say that? Keep in mind that a lot of first century Jewish people who were looking for the Messiah expected him to come as a political or military leader. But what they get is Jesus, this guy who gets killed. Right. And Mark wants to say that's not just an accident. Because God always shows up when you least, where you least expect God to be. Instead of coming in power, God comes in weakness. Instead of coming to fight and destroy, God comes to sympathize, to suffer, and eventually to die. Instead of coming with an army, God comes in the cross. Okay, I get the surprise element. God just doesn't do what we expect. But I'm not sure I understand why Mark wants to emphasize this point. That doesn't exactly sound like good news. It's Probably not if you're one of the powerful. You know, if you're a ruler or a warrior, you probably want a strong God because this kind of God can protect you. That's not what Mark's community or any of the early, but that's not Mark's community or any of the early Christians for that matter. What do you mean? Most of the early Christians are not from the powerful ruling classes of either Jewish or Roman culture. Most of them are the regular working folks and poor people. Jesus' disciples, for instance, aren't businessmen or religious or political figures. They're fishermen who are pretty far down on the economic ladder. There are exceptions, of course, 
Some early disciples are in fact wealthy and hold important positions, but they are the minority. Interesting. And this is particularly, particularly true of the folks Mark is writing to, who are enduring or maybe have just come out of a very difficult period. Whatever they once were, most of them are feeling pretty low, pretty down and out. And so Mark tells them that they don't have to be powerful to meet God. That God actually comes and meets them right where they are in the middle of their suffering and fear and pain. That's a powerful message. But are you saying that God only comes for powerless and poor people and not for the rich and powerful? I think what I'd say is that God is coming especially for the weak, the poor, and powerless, but not only for them. Certainly there are moments when each one of us, no matter how strong we may feel in general, find ourselves to be weak and vulnerable. Like when we get sick, or when someone we love dies, or when we lose a job, or suffer a miscarriage, or something like that. Right. Hmm. What? I'm trying to think this through. So God comes to the cross to identify with us, all of us, I suppose, but the weak and powerless for sure, which is all of us, at some time when we feel down and out. So Mark tells us that if we look for God to come as a strong, superhero-like warrior, we're going to be disappointed. Is that what you're saying? Not only will we be disappointed, but we'll actually miss the God who comes to be with us in our suffering, to hold on to us through our suffering, to stay with us even through death and to new life. I think I see what you mean. And what do you think? I think it's a pretty amazing message. Like Mark is ultimately saying that God is totally 100% for you on your side, but that you can't, just can't understand that apart from what Jesus does on the cross. Right, except that it doesn't just start with the cross. Throughout Mark's gospel, Jesus hangs out with the outcasts, the sinners, the losers, the people who have been left behind by society. In a way, his whole life and ministry bear the presence of God to those who wouldn't expect God to be with them. And all of that culminates in the cross. Which sounds like it would be very encouraging to Mark's people who have gone through their own suffering and also to us when we feel down and out. Exactly. I think I like Mark's story about the cross. I do too. And that's where we'll end for today.